Well, what's this satellite dish doing on the screen over here? Mankind has been probing space for quite a while. In 1983, Newsweek reported the real hope is not just to intercept an alien weather report, but to hear a message intended for Earth, <coughs> or for the universe at large. And in uh, 1983, US News and World Report wrote, if anyone is trying to get in touch with us, we're ready to listen. Hello, anybody out there? <laughs> Very interesting. The first cosmonaut that went up into space said, there wasn't any God there, we never saw him once. Well, you can expect that. Why are we so cut off? Why are we so cut off? The Bible tells us we are cut off because of sin. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden, Genesis 3, 8. So they hid themselves. We hid ourselves. Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. Behold, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hand, Isaiah 49, 15 and 16. If mankind wanted to, they wouldn't have to go floating up there and say, you, anybody out there? They can just read their Bible and look at history and they will know there is someone out there who cares enough. Amos 3 verse 7, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. God has always spoken to this earth through his prophets. And sometimes there was nobody left but his prophets. And sometimes the world was so iniquitous there weren't even prophets speaking anymore. Second Peter 1.21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So the Bible clearly says that prophecy is something that comes from God. God communicating His will to man. Now we don't want that. God actually wrote with His finger on stone and said, this is my will. If you adhere to this, we'll talk. Nope, we don't want that. We'll make our own. If there be a prophet amongst you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision, and I will speak unto him in a dream. Numbers 12, verse 6. So it's very important that we understand how does God communicate through his prophets, and how do we know whether someone is a prophet or a liar? So we have to follow the biblical criteria. So if there's a prophet, God will speak to him in a vision and in a dream. So here comes a guy and says, I've had a vision, I've had a dream, how do you know it's from God or whether it's from another source? God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began, Acts 3 verse 21. Man has really no excuse, shouldn't be cut off. And of course the greatest message of all time came in Jesus Christ. And the message was in John 12, 32, And I, if I am lifted up from earth, I will draw all to myself. This is the greatest message of all time. Despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 to 21. Today people despise prophecy because there's so much false prophecy. How do you know which is true and which is false? But the Bible says don't despise it, prove it, check it out. If it's from God, hold on to it. If not, get rid of it. How do I know if it's from God or whether it's not from God? Obviously God can't let us dangle there. Well, I feel it's from God or whatever. No, no, no. You have to know whether it's from God. Second Chronicles 20, 20. Believe in the Lord God, your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. Important that we listen to the prophets because they warn us of the hazards along the path. They may not speak out of harmony with God's word, but they tell us where we are in the stream of time. Matthew 24, 24. There shall arise false Christs, false prophets, shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that it were possible they shall deceive the very elect. Big problem. So now, how do I know which one is from God and which one is not? So I mustn't despise prophecy. I must prove it. I must hold on to that which is good. But I must watch out for false prophets. That's what the Bible says. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. This is a big job. 
The Lord is not asking from us a small thing here. This is a big job. Huge numbers of prophets out there. Which one is from God and which one is not? Try him. Check him out. Is it from God or is it not? And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, and thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his way. So a prophet talks about the coming of the Lord. Prepare yourselves for the coming of the Lord. Give knowledge of salvation. A true prophet will tell you how you can be saved unto his people by the remission of their sins. So a true prophet will not say, there is nothing worse that can be done than to talk of the lost sinful condition of man. True prophets won't say that. True prophets will say, we are all sinners and we need redemption in Jesus Christ. Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high has visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet in the way of peace. That's what a prophet should do. But a preacher can do that too. It doesn't have to be a prophet to do that. Anybody can do that as long as he sticks to the word of God. But a prophet, even more so. A prophet must be in line with the biblical teachings. So how do we test the prophets? How do we know if someone is a prophet of God or is not a prophet of God? Well, let's look at the criteria that the Bible gives. A true prophet's message must be in harmony with the Word of God and the law of God. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. The law is the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, which also contains the Ten Commandments, and the testimony is everything that the prophets have said in harmony with the Torah. Isaiah 8 verse 20, The law is no more. Her prophets also find no visions from the Lord. Lamentations 2 verse 9, God is not inconsistent. You cannot be out of harmony with God's word and then expect God to speak to you. So, they have to keep the law of God. They have to be in harmony with the law of God. And they have to speak according to the Bible and be obedient to its precepts, a true prophet. Well, that cuts out a lot of them. There goes Nostradamus, boop, gone. All his visions he got under drugs. Is that in harmony with the Bible? Don't think so. Two, a true prophet's predictions must come true. Deuteronomy 18.22 When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken, but the prophet has spoken presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. So every prophet that tells you which horse is going to win the next race, and he happens to be right, is from God, yes or no? No. Obviously this one must be qualified with what? with all the others. So everything must apply to the prophet, not just this one. Because a false prophet can also get things right. And then the worst of it is that a true prophet can actually say something that doesn't come to pass and still be a true prophet. Do we have examples in the Bible? Jonah? What did Jonah say? Nineveh is going to be destroyed. 40 days and it's all over. Was Nineveh destroyed? No. And Jonah knew it and he was totally freaked out because he knew that this might not come to pass. Why not? Because prophecy is conditional. You see, the prophet had told them, you are sinners and God is going to destroy this place. What did the Ninevites do? They repented in sackcloth and ashes and Jonah went and grumbled about this issue because he knew that now it could be construed that he was a false prophet. See? So careful how you deal with a true prophet's predictions must come true. Yes, a prophet m must be trustworthy. What he says must come true. But we mustn't forget the conditionalist aspect and we mustn't forget all the other aspects associated with it as well. So he must speak in accordance with the law. He must also be truthful. Thirdly, a true prophet edifies God's people. But he that prophesies speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that prophesies edifies the church. You see, God chooses prophets out of his church. When Saul was called, 
and became Paul, thereafter he was sent to the church. He was sent to the church to find out what he must do. He didn't send Paul to the church to tell the church what they must do. No, the other way around. So the prophets are in God's church. A true prophet exalts Christ as the Son of God, whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God, 1 John 4, 15. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them all, in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself, Luke 24, 27. Even Jesus was in harmony with that. So that Jesus must be exalted. Another point, point five, a true prophet speaks with authority. For he taught them as one having authority and not as one of the scribes, Matthew 7, 29. Yes, Elijah, John the Baptist, they had authority. They even rebuked kings. Number six, a true prophet will bear good fruit. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them, Matthew 7, verse 20. Interesting point. And then there's something that's very interesting. A true prophet will exhibit definite physical signs when in vision. Now let's read that. The prophet's eyes are open during a vision. He has said, which heard the words of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance. The King James Version has in cursive writing, which means it is included. It's not in the original Greek text. So falling, but having his eyes open. Numbers 24, verse 4. If you take the New King James, it's a pretty good translation of the original text. The utterance of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. So that's one of the physical attributes. The prophet falls down and has the eyes wide open. Now if you take the NIV, then you're in trouble. The oracle of one who hears the words of God, who sees the vis a vision of the Almighty, who falls prostrate, and whose eyes are opened. Hmm. That's not what the original Greek text says. The Greek text says his eyes are open. Here it can be spiritualized away. So again, with the modern translations based on the Westcott and Hort text, you cannot use them for doctrinal purposes. So, let's stick to what the King James and the New King James says. That's one of the attributes of a prophet. Important that we stick to the detail, the letter of the law. Second point of this physical attribute is a true prophet falls down, has no strength, is then strengthened, has no breath even while speaking, whilst in vision. Now, that's a tough act to follow. That's a very tough act to follow because only God has life in him and can give life to his prophet while he's speaking without breathing. Well, let's have a look at it. Daniel 10, 7 to 18. That's why some very modern Bibles will remove the whole of Daniel chapter 10. They don't like it. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. There remained no strength in me. Daniel's strength was taken away. I kept no strength. When I heard the voice of his words, then I was in a deep sleep on my face. So where was he? Down. Nor is there breath left in me. There's no breath in him. And then again, one like a man in form came and touched me and he made me stronger. There's the sequence. So the prophet has no strength. Prophet falls down. Prophet has no breath in him, and then someone raises him up and he becomes stronger. How strong does one tend to become when God touches you with strength? Kind of strong. How strong was Samson when God touched him? Well, imagine this. He caught a lion in midair and pulled him into two pieces. That's pretty strong. Can you imagine doing something like that? Or he went to the gates of the Philistine city, and picked up the gates, including the posts that were attached to it, and ripped the whole foundation out of the floor, lifted it up, ran up a hill, and plonked it on top of a hill. 
Well, that's pretty strong. Have you any idea how huge those gates were in the old days, plus the foundations and everything that goes with it? Pretty strong. Okay. Just for interest's sake. So that's what happens to this prophet when he goes into vision. Now, Daniel 10, 16, And behold, one in the likeness of the sons of men touched my lips, and I opened my mouth, and I spoke. In old English, spake and said unto him that stood before me, O my Lord, by reason of the vision my sorrows are turned upon me and I retain no strength. For how can the servant of this my Lord talk with this my Lord? For as for me, there remained no strength in me, neither was there breath left in me. Interesting, Daniel ten seventeen. So he's speaking to God and he's saying to God, How can I speak? I have no breath. Is this what is happening here? Okay. Now, New King James says, uh, Daniel 10, 17, As for me, no strength remains in me now, nor is any breath left in me. When you go to the NIV, you're in trouble. If you go to the RSV, you're in trouble. My strength is gone and I can hardly breathe. That's not what the original says. That is a lie. That's a blatant lie. I wonder why they put the blatant lie there. Are they trying to cover something up? Because their prophets fall down with eyes closed and they breathe while they are in vision. Is that a possibility? Do you think that's a possibility? I think that's a possibility. So what's the summary? The summary is the prophet falls down weak. Is that biblical? Second, he is raised up and strengthened by God. Is that biblical? Third, his eyes are wide open during a vision. Is that biblical? Fourth, he does not breathe during a vision but can speak. Is that biblical? That's what the Bible says. Now it sounds highly improbable, but that's what the Bible says. Plus all the other points that we mentioned, all of it must be in harmony. But this one, as you will imagine, is one that's a tough act to follow. Would you agree? That's a tough act to follow. Wherefore he says, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Ephesians 4, 8. So God gave all the gifts that are needed into the church. Some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. In 4, 11, everybody gets a gift. For the perfecting of the saints. That's what the gifts are there for. For the ministry, taking the message to the outside world. The edifying of the body of Christ. Ephesians 4, 12. So these gifts, these spiritual gifts, are to build up the church and to empower them to take the message to a dying world. That's what they're for. So God doesn't give these gifts to those outside to come and edify his church. No, his church gets the gifts to go and edify those outside. Never the other way around. Till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's the bottom line. And through this gift, God brings us into unity as to what is truth and what is not truth. Now what if we choose to reject the prophets of God? What happens then? Well, the people of old did it. What did they do to Isaiah? Did they like his message? No, so they took him and they sawed him in half. It's not a nice thing to do to a prophet, is it? Did they like the message of uh, Jeremiah? No, so they lowered him into a cistern, they beat him up, they put him into uh, all kinds of yokes, and they really tr mistreated him terribly. Well, they didn't like the messages of the prophets in the past. Do you think they'll like the messages of the prophets later on, maybe? Do you think things will change or maybe get worse? Who knows? And God has said some in the church, first apostles, then prophets, then teachers, then miracles, gifts of healing, helps, governments, deliverance, tongues, all kinds of gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. And that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Ephesians 4, 14. And then... The early church had wonderful prophets. There were the, most of the apostles were prophets in their own right. There were many other prophets, as we will see. And then slowly the church changed its rules. And towards the second century, towards the end, there was a new form. The disciples retired. Then the man of sin arose. 
And the horns were eyes like the eyes of a man speaking blasphemies, great things, heathenism, paganism came back into the church, shall wear out the saints of the Most High, think to change times and laws. Now if God's law no longer exists, what did the Bible say? The prophets will no longer find visions from the Lord. Remember that? Proverbs 29, 18. For there is, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. The law is no more. Her prophets also find no visions from the Lord. Lamentations 2 verse 9. So prophecies seem to dry up on this planet. Seem to dry up. And then God called the Reformation, but they didn't rediscover the law. They didn't come back into harmony with everything. God led them by their spirit. You can be led by the spirit, but that doesn't make you a prophet. So they preached great things. And at the end of time it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see vision. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. At the end of time, people will be empowered by the spirit. So some will dream things. To dream something by itself doesn't necessarily make you a prophet. Some will have visions. That's interesting. And uh, some will be called to the prophetic ministry, Revelation 12, 17. So what is this testimony of Jesus? Remember, we read it, and I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said to me, see that thou do it not. I'm a fellow servant of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, Revelation 19, 10. So the final church must have the prophetic gift again coming behind in no gift as they wait for the coming of the Lord. So the Bible predicts that the gift of prophecy will be restored to God's church in the last days. Well, did it happen or not? 1 Corinthians 1, 6, 7. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you so that you come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the end of time, when the law will be restored, when the great biblical truths come to the fore, then the gift of prophecy will be restored. So God's last day church would keep his commandments and have the gift of prophecy. This is a tough, tough situation. The sun shall be turned to darkness, do you remember, before the great coming of the day of the Lord, Joel, and the stars of heaven fell, untimely figs. We dealt with that when we dealt with this issue of Revelation chapter 10. William Miller started preaching about prophecy. Great things were again discovered. And at the same time, as William Miller starts preaching prophecy again, here arise a whole host of prophets. <coughs> Wherever you look, there are prophets. Now which one is from God and which one is not from God? That's an interesting question. Madame Blavatsky, she says, Lucifer is the Logos, the serpent, the savior. Satan is the only god of this planet. Does she sound like a true prophet to you? I think she doesn't sound like a true prophet to me because the very first biblical criteria, she stumbles and falls and is found wanting. Because that one says, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, they have no light in them. And then it also says that a true prophet will uplift Jesus Christ and will acknowledge him as the true son of God. This one says Lucifer is the son of God. Sorry, Madame Blavatsky, but you must be a false prophet. What about Joanna Southcott, mother of Christ? 1750 to 1814, she said, well, she was expecting Jesus Christ. She was pregnant with him, so convinced with her were her followers that upon her death they had an autops autopsy done to find if Jesus wasn't perhaps alive in her stall or the Messiah. Well, there was nothing there. So, strange. Did her prophecy come true? No. What about Russell? He claimed that he had prophetic visions. And what did he do? He demoted Jesus Christ. So, must be false prophet. What about Joseph Smith? Contradicted the Bible, left, right, and center. 
got messages from an angel Moroni that told him that he was the new priest and that uh, the true God was not the one that he claimed to be. No, no, no. The Mormons claimed the devil told the truth in Eden. Jehovah was the liar. Sorry, Joseph Smith. Sorry, Brigham Young. You must be false prophets. You're not speaking according to the law. Neither are you speaking according to the testimony. And who your angel Moroni is, I don't know. Mormon Temple, Salt Lake City. What about Nostradamus? Did he speak things that came true? Well, you can interpret them after the fact that it might be so, because, you know, his verses sort of seem to imply that. Well, if uh, taking drugs is a way to get uh, prophetic insights, then great. Did he live the life? Bear good fruits? I doubt it. All these millennial prophets, what about the Gnostic prophets? They all taught that Jesus was not the Son of God and that there was another deity. What about Edgar Case, the great healer and prophet? Well, he also taught that we were basically God. What about Pope Pius? He said all authority is vested in him. He also had visions. And he said that the Roman Catholic Church would anchor the gospel ship. Very interesting. But it wasn't according to the law, neither according to the testimony. In fact, they did exactly the opposite. What about our friend Alistair, well, I wouldn't like to call him a friend, Alistair Crowley, and his all-seeing eye, this great prophet and magician of, the, of this New Age era, the great uh, spokesman for the great rock bands of the world. Well, one of the most, wow, outspoken critics of the Bible that the world has ever said, seen. He wants it to be kissed by the wanton kisses of Babylon. Interesting quotes. Maria Devi Christos, Jim Jones, all of these claimed to be messiahs. They turned out to be anything but messiahs. So here in the 1840s here were all these false prophets and there was this group of Advent believers and a young man by the name of William Foy, he received visions. And then... He refused to speak about these visions because he said he was black and therefore people wouldn't accept him because of the prejudice of the age. Then a man by the name of Hazen Foss, he had visions and he said, no, the consequences are too tough. I'm not going to repeat this to anyone. So he kept it to himself. So here were young men having visions, but they refused to go and speak. And then a young woman by the name of Ellen G. Harmon, who later married and became Ellen G. White, born in 1827, died in 1915, California. She received visions. She was a young girl. And uh, after I had the vision and God gave me light, he bade me deliver it, but I shrank from it. I was young, and I thought they would not receive it from me. That's what she said. But then one day she decided she would give statements made by Hazen Foss. Now, this was the man who previously had had a vision. He refused to give it. Then one day he decided to try and give it, and he couldn't remember what he had seen. And then he attended a meeting where this young Ellen Harmon was speaking about what she saw, and he said to her, The Lord gave me a message to bear to his people, and I refused after being told the consequences. I heard you talk last night, and I believe the visions are taken from me and given to you. Do not refuse to obey God, for it will be at the peril of your soul. I am a lost man. You are chosen of God. Be faithful in doing your work, and the crown I might have had, you will receive. Well, that's an interesting story. So here is a young girl now with a very interesting history. When she was but a young girl, a classmate threw a stone at her and hit her on the head, and she became debilitated, and her front here above the nose, was crushed in, and she could not attend more than three years of schooling. So this young girl, at the age of 12, was debilitated. Here's a photograph that's of her, where you can see the one eye is slightly higher than the other. She was pretty badly injured, but of course, they, in those days, they didn't have the surgery techniques that they have today. And this is the young girl, that started following Miller's message together with many others and then received these uh, visions and one of them concerned the sanctuary and what it stands for. A very fascinating vision about Christ being the minister 
of a sanctuary in heaven, which is to be found in the book of, of Hebrews. Now remember that uh, the dragon was going to be wroth with the remnant that keeps the commandments and would have the testimony of Jesus. He was going to be angry. So the final battle, the woman in white and the dragon and his synagogue, well, they were going to clash. The testimony of Jesus, the spirit of prophecy, so that you become behind in no gift as you wait for the coming of the Lord. And remember Second Peter, which says, we have a more sure word of prophecy, where unto you do well, that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for no prophecy ever came by the will of man, but men spake from God, being moved by the Holy Spirit. So the question is, is this from God or is it from the devil? Test the prophets, the Bible says. Not all prophets contributed to the scriptures. One argument would be, but did this person contribute anything to the scriptures? Answer is no. God used both men and women as a prophet because this was a female. Examples in the Old Testament, Nathan and Gad, 2 Samuel and 1 Samuel, they didn't contribute to the scriptures. Prophetesses included Miriam, Exodus 15.20, Huldah the prophetess, 2 Kings 22.14, and Deborah, Judges 4.4. 4. Examples in the New Testament of prophets and prophetesses that didn't take up, weren't taken up in the canon include Simeon, Anna Agabus, Barnabas, Philip's four daughters. These were all prophets in the Bible that didn't contribute to the Bible. So the vital question, did she fulfill the biblical criteria? It's a very interesting question that I would like to know. Well, Manuscripts 88, 1900. The Lord has said, Write out the things which I shall give you. And I commenced when I was very young to do this work. My hand that was feeble and trembling because of infirmities became steady as soon as I took the pen in my hand. And since those first writings, I've been able to write. She was only 17 years old, had only three years of schooling, and started to write. So one argument that people have, can God use someone that is so physically weak and only has three years of schooling? Well, yes. In fact, God can use a donkey. <laughs> Didn't he use a donkey? Yes, he used a donkey. And what happens if you refuse to listen to the donkey? Well, then you could just die. <laughs> you see? So if you could use a donkey, then surely you could use someone with three years of education. That's better than a donkey. I don't recall donkeys going to school, do you? So anyway, she says, as soon as I took a pen in my hand, and since those first writings, I've been able to write. So now let's look at the criteria. Did she exalt the Word of God and the law of God? The Bible. What did she write? Selected Messages, Volume 2. The Holy Scriptures are to be accepted as an authoritative, infallible revelation of His will. They are to be the standard of character, the revealer of doctrine, and the test of experience. Bible. Cling to your Bible as it reads and stop your criticism in regard to its validity and obey the Word of God and not one of you will be lost. Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 18. And now, what is supposed to be the creed? Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 416. The Bible, and the Bible alone, is to be our creed. The sole bond of union. God's word is infallible. Lift up the banner on which is inscribed the Bible, our rule of faith and discipline. Question. If you wrote so much, and the Bible is to be our only creed, then why bother to write so much? Isn't the Bible enough? Well, aren't the people confusing the Bible today everywhere, left, right, and center? So, she cannot add anything, she cannot subtract anything, she can just write, put light upon what there is already present. That's all that she could do. Because she clearly says, the Bible and the Bible alone is to be our creed. So if somebody comes and says, aha, but here it says that you must do this, that, and the other, and say, where do you get that from? It say, Show it to me in the Bible. If it's not there, goodbye. Five testimonies. 
The Lord designs to warn you, to reprove, to counsel through the testimonies given, and to impress your minds with the importance of the truth of his word. So that's what it's for. The written testimonies are not to give new light, but to impress vividly upon the heart the truths of inspiration already revealed. That's what the prophets did all along. Man's duty to God and to his fellow man has been distinctly specified in God's word. Yet but few of you are obedient to the light given. Additional truth is not brought out, but God has through the testimony simplified the great truths already given and in his own chosen way brought them before the people to awaken and impress the mind with them that all may be left without excuse. So here is something that seems to be in, law, in harmony with the law and the Bible. Five, Fifteen manuscripts released, then present them the prophecies, show them the purity and binding claims of the law of God. Not one jot or tittle of this law is to lose its force, but hold its binding claims upon every soul to the end of time. Is that in harmony with the law and the, and the testimony? Yeah. Cannot men see that to belittle the law of God is to dishonor Christ? Why did he come to this world to suffer and die if the law is not binding upon human beings? That makes sense. Called to expose the man of sin? In the very time in which we live, the Lord has called his people and has given them a message to bear. He has called them to expose the wickedness of the man of sin, who has made the Sunday law a distinctive power, who has thought to change times and laws and to oppress the people of God who stand firmly to honor him by keeping the only true Sabbath, the Sabbath of creation, as holy unto the Lord. That's definitely in harmony with the scriptures, maybe not in harmony with the feelings of many organizations in the world, but it's biblical. Did our predictions come true? Well, that's an interesting point. San Francisco earthquake, April 18, 1906, she predicted it. Yes, it came true. She predicted great turmoil and wars. The Lord declares through the prophet Isaiah, Associate yourselves, O ye people, and you shall be broken in pieces. And give ear, all ye far countries, gird yourselves, and you shall be broken in pieces. This is a quote direct from Isaiah 8, 9-3. Gird yourselves, and you will be broken in pieces. Take counsel together, and it shall come to naught. Speak the word, and it shall not stand, for God is with us. For the Lord spoke thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, A confederacy to all them to whom the people shall say, A confederacy. Neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. Now here's an interesting scripture. What does it mean? You can have a thousand interpretations. Here's an interesting one. She writes, there are those who question whether it is right for Christians to belong to Freemasons and other secret societies. Let all such consider the scriptures just quoted. If we are Christians at all, we must be Christians everywhere and must consider and heed the counsel given to make us Christians according to the standard of God's word. Oh, interesting statement. This terrible picture drawn by John, the Revelation, shows how completely the powers of earth will give themselves over to evil and should show those who have received the truth how dangerous it is to link up with secret societies or to join themselves in any way to those who do not keep God's commandments. Fascinating stuff, 14 manuscript release. By a variety of images, the Lord Jesus presented to John the wicked character and the seductive influence of those who have been distinguished for their persecution of God's people. This starts to make Revelation come alive. There's nothing new here. It stands in the book of Revelation. God's presentation of the detestable works of the inhabitants of the ruling powers of the world will bind themselves into secret societies, confederacies not honoring the law of God. Keep clear of these evils. More and more false religionists of the world manifest their evil doing. There are but two parties. Those who keep the commandments of God and those who war against God's law. Very interesting. And so she continues here with a host of quotes dealing with this very issue. Four manuscripts release is fascinating. In the world, gigantic monopolies will be formed. Now remember, this is written 150 years ago. Do we find today gigantic monopolies being formed? Absolutely, everywhere. Men will bind themselves together in unions that will wrap them in the folds of the enemy. 
a few men will combine to grasp all the means to be obtained in a certain line of business. Is that happening today? Do we have mega stores, mega banks, mega this, mega that, yes or no? Absolutely. Trade unions will be formed. Will be formed, take note. And those who refuse to join these unions will be marked men. Is that happening today, yes or no? Absolutely. I've stood on the other side of trade unions gone berserk. It's scary, let me tell you. It's scary. The trade unions will be one of the agencies that will bring about upon this earth a time of trouble such as not been since the world began. Can you imagine the turmoil that happens when labor unrest comes to a country? Unbelievable. I can tell you stories about this. Unbelievable. 150 years ahead of time. What does the world teach? It's a human right to have all of these. It's a human right. In the revelation of his righteous judgments, God will break up all these associations. In the judgment shall sit, the books will be opened, and the unchristlikeness of the whole confederacy will be plain to other. They serve gods as useless to save as the gods of the Hindus. Interesting. The message we bear must be as direct as the message of John, who rebuked kings for their iniquity. Fascinating stuff. We do not go deep enough in our search for truth. Every soul who believes present truth will be brought where he will be required to give a reason for the hope that is in him. The people of God will be called upon to stand before kings, princes, rulers, great men of the earth, and they must know that they do know what is truth. They must be converted men and women. God can teach you more in one moment by His Holy Spirit than you could learn from the great men of the earth. The universe is looking upon the controversy that is going on upon the earth. It's very Christ-centered. It's Bible-centered. And this is happening all over the world. Those who stand under the bloodstained banner of Prince Emmanuel cannot be united with Freemasons or secret organizations. Either you are with Christ or you are against him. At an infinite cost, God has provided for every man an opportunity to know that which will make him wise unto salvation. How eagerly do angels look to see what will avail himself of this opportunity. When a message is presented to God's people, they should not rise up in opposition to it. They should go to the Bible, comparing it with the law and the testimony, and if it does not bear this test, it is not true. God wants our minds to expand. He desires to put his grace upon us. We may have a feast of good things every day, for God can open the whole treasure of heaven to us. Does it sound biblical? I think it does. The judgments of earth are abroad. Floods, tempests, wrath will be poured out, etc. Interesting stations. The nation will be on the side of the rebel nation. And then you have these great events of our time, the Twin Towers. 1904, in a manuscript she writes, when I was last in New York, I was in the night season called upon to behold buildings rising story after story towards heaven. That's before New York had high-rise buildings. These buildings were warranted to be fireproof and they were erected to glorify the owners. Higher and still higher these buildings rose. And in them the most costly material was used. The scene that next passed was an alarm of fire. Men looked at lofty and supposedly fireproof buildings and said they are perfectly safe. But these buildings were consumed as if made of pitch. The fire engines could nothing do nothing to stay the destruction. She says, I awoke and from my window I saw a terrible conflagration. Great balls of fire were falling upon houses. And from these balls, fiery arrows were flying in every direction. If you watch television, you will have seen this vision in detail. It was impossible to check the fires. Many places was being destroyed. The terror of the people was indescribable. While appearing to the children of men as a great physician to heal their maladies, he maladies, will bring disease and disaster. And then she goes on to explain... And she uses the text, The earth mourneth and fadeth away, the haughty people do languish, the earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinances, broken the everlasting covenant, Isaiah 24, 4 and 5. She used the Bible for every single thing. 
to the law and to the testimony. If they keep not according to this word, they have no light in them. Now there's one other thing that is very interesting that Ellen White saw, and that is the great health vision. This is an amazing vision that really fascinated me. Now, as a scientist and as a physiologist, this was something that stunned me. In 1864 she wrote, Tobacco is a poison of the most deceitful and malignant kind, having an exciting and then a paralyzing influence upon the nerves of the body. It is all the more dangerous because its effect upon the system are so slow and at first scarcely perceivable. Multitudes have fallen victim to its poisonous influence. Well, that's no big deal, everybody knows. Cigarettes are bad for you. But this was written in 1864, when the medical world was teaching that this was the new cure to all lung ailments. And when the medical world was saying, smoke and this will help you, and it'll get rid of all your problems, all your maladies, here comes one little woman and writes exactly the opposite to what the world was teaching. It was not until 1957 that a committee of scientists appointed by the American Cancer Society and the American Heart Association concluded that smoking was a causative factor in lung cancer. So she is way ahead of her time, no doubt. What did she write about tea and coffee? What did she write about the lifestyles that people have in the world today? What did she write about foods high in cholesterol and all of these things? Today we have fear, fear in the food chain, toxins. We have uh, encephalitis diseases. We have diseases amongst animals as you cannot imagine. I made this part of my research at the university and I received awards for the research that we were doing. And I even received from, um, from London, I received an award to do research in this particular field from the Royal Society of London. I was one of only five scientists to receive this. We did so many tests on transfer of diseases from animals to man and amazing things that we discovered. Health alert over chickens. Deadly eggs, says Der Spiegel. Ellen White wrote, in 1901, soon butter will never be recommended. Has it come to pass? Absolutely. And after a time, milk will be entirely discarded for disease in animals is increasing in proportion to the increase of wickedness among men. The time will come when there will be no safety in using eggs, milk, cream, or butter. Deadly eggs. Incredible. She saw a deterioration in the animal world. Flesh was never the best food, but it is now doubly objectionable since disease in animals is so rapidly increasing. And she talks about milk, that it should be thoroughly sterilized. With this precaution, there's less danger of contracting disease way ahead of a time. Butter is less harmful when eaten on cold bread than when used in cooking. Now, hold on. How did she know that? You see, how could she know that when butter is heated, it forms free radicals which are carcinogenic number one and which cause clogging of the arteries. Nobody knew that in her day. This was way ahead of time, so very simple. You take butter and you do the tests and you find out what happens and you'll see this is correct. This is correct. But as a rule it is better to dispense with it altogether. Way ahead of a time. Cheese is still more objectionable and it's wholly unfit for food. Wow, you say that loud. I have a whole lecture on this that I give in scientific circles and there's no two ways about this one. It's one of the most allergenic foods in the world. Asthma would probably disappear. Osteoporosis would probably disappear from the face of the earth if people would take heed to these, these suggestions. Cheese should never be introduced into the stomach. Which countries have the highest rate of osteoporosis in the world? The Netherlands, Norway, all the dairy countries, they have the highest rate of osteoporosis. Why? Because they're eating a food with the highest acid-forming content in the world, which has to be neutralized by calcium release from the bone and causes osteoporosis. We could save ourselves a lot of trouble here. Let the diet reform be progressive. Let people be taught how to prepare food without the use of milk or butter. Let them that the time will soon come when there will be no safety in using eggs, milk, cream or butter because disease in animals is increasing, increasing in proportion to the wickedness of men. Very interesting. The killers all around. That's what science is saying. 
In all parts of the world, provision will be made to supply the place of milk and eggs. Has it happened? Yes, today you get rice milk, soy milk, uh, oat milk, you name it, nut milk. And the Lord will let us know when the time comes to give up these art. He desires all to feel that we have a gracious Heavenly Father who will instruct them in all things. And the Lord will give dietetic art and skill to his people in all parts of the world, teaching them how to use for the sustenance of life the products of the earth. Wonderful regard. Now in regard to milk and sugar, I know of persons who have become frightened of health reform and said it would have nothing to do with it because it is spoken against the free use of these things. Changes should be made with great care. We should move cautiously and wisely. There's no fanaticism here. We want to take the course that will recommend itself to the intelligent men and women of the land. Large quantities of milk and sugar eaten together are injurious. They impart impurities to the system. Sugar clogs the system. It hinders the working of the living machine. This must be rubbish, right? Unless you go and test it. Now what's the problem with milk and sugar? What's the problem there? With? Well, a scientist came to my university and he had a lecture to give to the physiology department. I'm at a to I was a totally secular university. And he said, I did research on the combination of milk and sugar for a chocolate company. Because that's what chocolate is, the combination of milk and sugar, right? And he said, what I found is so hair-raising I'll never be funded again by a chocolate company. Number one, if I took the milk by itself, the triglycerides went up, the cholesterol went up, and the sugar went up in the blood and came down after three hours. If I take the sugar by itself, I was surprised to see the triglycerides go up, I saw the cholesterol levels go up, and the sugar go up, and then end in hypoglycemia. That was bad. But when I combined them, it was a total nightmare. Because not only did they rise more than double, but it stayed like that for 10 hours. So the best recipe for dying in your sleep is to take a milk and sugar combination just before you go to sleep. Because it'll slow down your blood. Sugar clogs the system to such an extent that you could die. And most people actually die in their sleep of heart attacks. And that's a favorite drink. Before you go to sleep, you take milk and sugar because it switches off the brain. And then you go to sleep. Well, she said that 150 years ago. Isn't that surprising? What wonderful things. Someone may attempt to explain how she said all these things. How did she quote from the current literature? Well, how would you know what to quote? Ministry of healing, temperance, councils on diets and food. There is a host of stuff in there. Did she edify the church? Did she do that? I said that I did not claim to be a prophetess. I have not stood before the people claiming this title, though I may, many called me thus. I've been instructed to say I'm God's messenger, sent to bear a message of reproof. So some said, okay, she says she's not a prophetess. To claim to be a prophetess is something I have never done. If others call me by that name, I have no controversy with them. So they put pressure on her. Are you a prophet or are you not a prophet? She says, you know, there are so many false prophets out. Why should I say I'm a prophet? I'm a prophet. She was humble about it. I cannot call myself other than a messenger sent to bear a message from the Lord to his people and to take up of work in any line that he points out. Well, during the discourse I said that I did not claim to be a prophetess. Some were surprised at the statement and as much as being said in regard to it, I will make an explanation. Others have called me a prophetess, but I have never assumed this title. I have ne not felt that it was my duty to thus designate myself. Those who boldly assume that they are prophets in this day are often a reproach to the cause of Christ. My work includes much more than this name signifies. I regard myself as a messenger entrusted by the Lord with messages for his people. I am now instructed that I am not to be hindered in my work by those who engage in suppositions regarding its nature, whose minds are struggling with so many issues. My commission embraces the work of a prophet but it does not end there. So she said she was a prophet. She said she was a prophet. Did she exalt Christ as the Son of God? This is a beautiful statement in the Review and Herald. The world's Redeemer was treated as we deserve to be treated in order that we might be treated as he deserved to be treated. He came to our world and took our sins upon his divine soul that we might receive his imputed righteousness. He was condemned for our sins in which he had no share that we might be justified by his righteousness in which we had no share. 
I wish I had only three years of education and could write like that. The Desire of Ages, probably one of the greatest books ever written. No, I'll qualify that. I believe it is the greatest book ever written on the life of Jesus Christ. Anybody who reads that will be stunned. Her writings, only one other woman compares. And that woman's name is Alice A. Bailey. She exalts Lucifer and says, I have no other task but to prepare the world for the coming of the coming one, who is Lucifer. And this one over here says, no other life task but to prepare the way for the coming of Jesus Christ, the one in the Bible, to the law and to the testimony. Christ's object lessons, the desire of ages, steps to Christ, thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. Wow, there are so many books dealing with Jesus Christ, it's unbelievable, all painfully written by hand, manuscript of the manuscript. Did you speak with authority? I'm instructed to say that those who endeavor to tear down the foundations of what made us Seventh-day Adventists, we are God's commandment keeping people. For the past 50 years, every phase of heresy has been brought to bear upon us to becloud our mind regarding the teachings of the Word. He calls upon us to hold firmly with a grip of faith to the fundamental principles that are based on unquestionable authority. Did she bear good fruit? Well, wherever she went today, there are hospitals, there are teaching institutions. Everywhere the work has been built up. This was where she lived when she died, Elmshaven, and uh, Simple Table, that's where she wrote most of her visions. This is one of her great-great-granddaughters, Gladys Kubrock, and uh, she still talks about some of the things that she remembers. Did she exhibit the physical signs? Now, here is the crux of the matter. You see, the prophet has to fulfill all the signs. Does she qualify? Let me summarize them for you once again. Number one, the prophet falls down weak. We got this from the Bible and the Bible alone, remember? Number two, raised up and strengthened by God. Number three, eyes were opened during a vision. Number four, does not breathe during a vision but can speak. Tough act to follow. Now, these were tent meetings. Now, normally, prophets go into vision in some secluded little room with a bunch of people around them, all convinced or whatever. Not this one. Ellen White went into visions publicly with thousands of people and skeptics all around. And publicly, in front of all those people, God gave her visions. Later on in life, when this was no longer necessary, most of her visions were in dreams. But when she started off, the visions were public visions. And what happened at those visions? Well, here are the writings. In passing into visions, she gets three enraptured shouts of glory, which echo and re-echo. Then, for about four or five seconds, she seems to drop down like a person in a swoon or one having lost his strength. She then seems to be instantly filled with superhuman strength, sometimes rising at once to her feet, walking about the room or in the tent meeting or in the gathering or wherever she was. Her eyes are always open, but she does not wink. Her hand is raised and she looks upward, not with a vacant stare, but with a pleasant expression. Eyewitness account, June 12, 1868. She walked back and forth and talked to us, and as she walked, she fell right down. Prophet falls down. She fell down gently. There was no catcher behind her. She went down as an angel's hand was under her. Sister White lay perfectly quiet and unconscious. Her eyes were open. With a pleasant expression on her face, nothing unnatural and unusual. Brother White, there was a husband, said to these large men, take her hands apart. There she was lying. Take her hands apart. You have two hands to her one. Just pull her hands apart. There was this frail little girl lying there. So they tried. They pulled and pulled till some of us got anxious that they would hurt her. This is a public vision. Brother White said, don't be anxious. She is safe in God's keeping. You can pull until you are perfectly satisfied. They said, we are satisfied. Now, we don't need to pull anymore. He said, take up one finger at a time. This was impossible. They could not so much as move a finger. It seemed like a block of granite. Brother White said to these men, now hold her. When she got up, 
and she started speaking and moving her hands and speaking about whatever she saw. I think they thought they could. They grasped her by the wrist, but they could not retard the motion. So these big men, when she went like this, they went along, whether they liked it or not. It looked like any child could hold her, but she went on just the same. Now we must see if her eyelids were closed. There was a large rust, that's the lamp, close by. We moved the shave, put the light right in front of her eyes. We thought she would move her eyes to protect them. She didn't. She was perfectly unconscious. The eyelids did not close. Brother White said we must see if there's any breath in her body. There didn't seem to be any. Everything looked all right, only there was no breath. Brother White said, now we will send out and get a mirror and we will test it. So someone went to the next door and got a mirror and was held close to her face, but no moisture gathered, so there was no breathing. All right. Then she went into vision again and medical doctors, skeptics, came to test. Two physicians came in, an old man and a young man. Brother White was anxious that they should examine Sister White closely, which they did. A looking glass was brought. One of them held the two over her mouth while she talked. But very soon they gave this up and said she doesn't breathe. They then closely examined her sides as she spoke to find some evidence of deep breathing, but they did not find it. As they closed this part of the examination, she arose to her feet, still in vision, holding a Bible high up, turning from page to passage, quoting correctly, although the eyes were looking upward and away from the Bible. So she held the Bible up like this, and paged like this, quoting from the Bible. So somebody must have gotten up on a chair and checked it out, and yes, it was right. And here this little girl was holding this huge family Bible for hours on end, while she was speaking and not breathing. After Mrs. White rose to her feet, as they have stated, quoting the texts of Scripture, Dr. Fleming called for a lighted candle. He held this candle as near to her lips as possible without burning and in direct line with her breath in case she breathed. There was not the slightest flicker of the blaze. The doctor then said with emphasis, that settles it forever, there's no breath in her body. Either this is true or it's not true. These are public, public meetings. The gift of prophecy, 1844 to 1915. Either it is from God, or it is not from God. Well, today, this prophet sleeps. This prophet is no longer there, but the writings linger. She showed no spiritual pride. She sought no filthy lucre. She lived the life and did the work of a worthy prophetess, the most admirable of the American succession. This is the New York Independent. August 23, 1925. A totally independent source. So now we have this choice. Do you know what happened to me? When I began to discover the truths of the Bible, I said the Bible and the Bible alone. I don't need this stuff. I don't need this. Give me the Bible. It does everything for me. I don't need anything else. And then I got a phone call from a colleague of mine who had heard that I had become an Adventist. And first he gave me blazers for having become an Adventist. And then he went to town on this woman. I'd never read a word of hers. I'd become an Adventist on the Bible and the Bible alone. Nothing to do with the spirit of prophecy. And then he went to town. And he called her the most terrible things that you can imagine. He was so irate about this. And the words that came out of his mouth I don't even want to repeat them. And when he put the phone down, I thought to myself, now, who is this? That someone should be so angry about these writings. So I went and found them and started reading. And the more I read, and I couldn't read without my Bible next to me, and my Bible started coming alive. And for the first time, I understood Jesus Christ and what he meant for me. And I could have found it in the Bible, but I couldn't find it in that depth that I found it explained in the spirit of prophecy. The Bible became alive. She didn't take me away from the Bible, she led me to the Bible. And so, this prophet that is demeaned in the world, that is detested in the world, if anybody hears even the name, they will say the most horrendous things about this prophet. 
a liar, a plagiarist, to this, to that, the other, you name it. Test the prophets. Now, isn't it so that when the prophet is loved and revered in the world, that there's probably a problem with it? Why is Alice A. Bailey honored at the level of the United Nations? Why are her writings the basis of the world core curriculum? Why does this prophetess influence the world so much and this one is so despised? Interesting question. So my answer to you is, if it is from God, then accept it and read it. And if you find that it takes you away from the Bible, throw it aside and read the Bible and the Bible alone. Because after all, she does say, we have no other creed except the Bible. So the proof of the pudding is in the eating. But every single biblical criterion is fulfilled by her. And I know of no other prophet of modern times that qualifies. Not one.